There's this one guy. <laughs> he was a total failure, okay? A total letdown, a total disappointment, right? Like Charlie Brown, right? And I know it's not like any one of us here in this room, right? None of us are ever like that, right? This guy, everything that he had ever attempted to do went wrong. Always, right? But he was a dreamer. He always dreamed about being rich, right? His whole life, right? So one day he says, man, I would really like to be rich, man. So I'm going to do what's going to get me the most money in the shortest amount of time. What do you think that was? <laughs> I'm going to rob a bank. <laughs> Another bank robber, right? <laughs> well, this guy, I'm not kidding. This guy, he would plan his strategy. He wanted to get rich so bad. He would plan his strategy. He would stay up late at night writing and making notes. Okay, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get in? How am I going to break in? And how am I going to do it, right? Every night he would do this, right? But then when the morning came, he was paralyzed with fear and anxiety. And he said, I, I, I don't know if I could really do it. I don't know if I can really pull it off. I don't know if I can do it, right? So one night he determined and he's finishing up his, his, his plan, right? He said, okay, tomorrow morning... I'm going to do it. I don't care what happens. I'm going to force myself to get up and to go rob that bank. Well, the morning came and he woke up and the anxiety attack hits him again. Oh, I don't know, man. I'm going to get caught, right? Uh, finally, finally, he talks himself into getting into his car and driving to the bank. He gets to the car, right, to the bank, and he's in his car. He's there at the bank, right, and he's waiting. And he spent three hours trying to talk himself to get out of the car and to go into the bank and rob the bank, right? <laughs> Remember, he had this plan already, right? He had it all planned out, right? So finally, he says, okay, self, I got to get out. I got to go. I'm going to do this. I want to get rich. I'm going to rob this bank. I got a perfect plan. So he goes in, right? The anxiety is hitting him while he's walking in, right? And get a load of this, right? He walks up to the bank teller, and he's so nervous, right, that he hands the bank teller his pistol, <laughs> Instead of the note, <laughs> he hands her the pistol. He takes off his mask, and this is what he said to her. Don't stick with me. This is a mess up. <laughs> Remember, this guy was a failure in everything he ever did, right? <laughs> Remember, he was incompetent, he was lousy, and he was useless as a bank robber. Think about that. Most of us as Christians, we don't recognize how vulnerable we are in our spiritual failure. At any moment, we could become like this would-be bank robber. At any moment, we could become the worst follower of Jesus that there has ever been. At any moment, we, we could become incompetent, lousy, and useless as a follower of Christ. Like this old bank robber, right? <laughs> Failed at everything, right? <laughs> We are on the second sermon for the sermon series, The Last Week of Christ. We're taking a look at the last week of Jesus, right? And I hope y'all can read this. Last week we talked about on Saturday, Jesus was with Mary of Bethany, right, where she poured the expensive perfume on him. On Sunday, Jesus gets the welcome going into Jerusalem, right, the Palm Sunday, all that, right? On Monday, he chases the people out of the temple, right? On Tuesday, He's teaching the crowds the God's word right on Wednesday. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say what he did on Wednesday. We don't know. And then on Thursday, though, he does the Lord's Supper. And on Friday, he gets arrested. And remember, we, we talked about where was he when he got arrested? The Garden of Gethsemane. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. A lot of things happen on Friday. Look at that. He gets arrested. He goes to trial, he gets convicted, he gets executed, and he's buried all in one day on Friday. That's a lot going on. A lot of times we think of it as, oh, it happened throughout more. This is all one week. This is all one week. Today we're talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, verses 31 through 46, right? We're going to take a look at the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, the great victory that Jesus had at the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're also going to take a look at the failure of the disciples in that same dark hour when Jesus was arrested. So let's get into it. Let's get, let's see what's going on. Let's take a look at our first point here. Your allegiance to Jesus is meaningless 
unless you keep it. We all say, no, 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 I'm faithful. I'm going to be faithful. I'll follow Jesus for the rest of my life. But your allegiance to Jesus is meaningless unless you keep it. Let's look at verses 31 through 35. Matthew 26, verses 31 through 35. Let's read that real quick. Pay attention. Watch, watch what it says. Look, This is very, very interesting. Verse 31. Then Jesus told them, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. Do you see that? And he said, for it is written, this, this, is, this has been prophesied, right? I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Verse 32, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Verse 33, and Peter replied, no, no, no. Even if I fall away, Jesus, on account of you, I never will. Look at verse 34. Truly, I tell you, Jesus told Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Wow. Verse 35. Peter said, no, 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 Jesus. You got this all wrong. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Look at the last part. And all the other disciples said the same. We're with you, Jesus. Even if we have to die. Have you ever said that? <laughs> Have you ever done that? <laughs> I've said it. <laughs> and I failed too. <laughs> In these verses, Jesus makes three prophecies. He says, you will all, all fall away. I will go before, I will go to Galilee. I'll meet you there, but I'm going to be there before you are. And then he says, and then Peter's going to disown me three times before the rooster crows. That's before the morning comes, right? The rooster starts crowing at what time? At sunup. Sunup, right, La? At yeah. sunup. Not just once. Jesus said, but Peter, you're going to disown me three times, right? And Jesus said, all of you will fall away. Said, what, what, wait a minute, I thought John was the only one that stuck. No, no, Jesus said, all of you, 12 out of 12, are going to fall away. Even John the apostle fell away, right? Oh, man, and Peter says, no, 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 wait, Jesus, you got this all wrong. I, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to fail you, Jesus. I'm not going to. In verse 33, that Peter says, you know what, Jesus? I bet everything on my faith. I believe in you so much. My faith is that strong that I will not fall away. And he goes against the words of Jesus. And he says, Jesus, I know you're God and you prophesy and you never lie. But Jesus, you're wrong. I will never fall away. And then look at verse 35. In verse 35, Peter raises the ante. And he says, Jesus, I bet my house that I will not fall away from you. Jesus, I bet my Harley Davidson that I will not fall away from you. Jesus, I bet my favorite jacket that I will not fall away from you. Jesus, I bet my six children. I don't know how many children Peter had. But he said, I bet my six children and my neighbor's children too, Jesus. He said, Jesus, I bet my, my mother's best molcajete that I will not fall away from you. <laughs> Did you know these things are solid? Did you know my mom broke one of these on my dad's back one time? <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> these things are solid rock. And she threw it and hit him in his back and it broke. <laughs> that was before we knew Jesus, right? That was before, right? But Peter bets it all on his faith. To Jesus, my faith is courageous. My faith is strong. I will not. And then he throws all the other apostles under the bus. And he says, you know what? These fools over there, right? These dirty, unfaithful dogs, they're going to leave you, Jesus. But I will. They will. But I never will, right? <sighs> but then the Bible says, the other disciples said, no, 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 Jesus. Peter's wrong. You're wrong. Peter's wrong. We, we won't. All the apostles were determined not to fail Jesus. And they all pledged loyalty to him, right? But guess what? You know what got them in trouble? Their own weakness. And they did not know how the enemy fights against us as well. Their own weakness and then the enemy coming and, the, man, it just messes us up, right? Totally, totally. That's what we struggle with. We say, no, 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 Lord, I will never turn my back on you. Woo! But think about that. 
I think Johnny mentioned this in Sunday school. When it comes to the point of death, oh man, when somebody threatens you, okay, okay, I, 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 I take it back. You know, I, I will denounce Jesus. I will fail him. We need to always, always be faithful to the Lord. And how would you handle that situation that night in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus comes and tells them, hey, man, it's coming. The hour is coming, right? How would you have handled that? How would you have uh, handled the promise to never forsake Jesus? Think about this. When big disappointment hits you, a physical pain, a death of a loved one, what about that? A grave illness, an injustice, a, a, a bout of depression that we're struggling with something so big, right? Or how about that one small sin in our lives that's getting out of hand that we haven't dealt with it is getting so, so big, right, that it just starts to consume us and brings our life to ashes and ruin. When you're faced with such a time like this and you promise never to deny Jesus, what happens? We're usually met with an unexpected enemy, and that's ourselves. Think about this. In the end, if you fail the Lord and you turn your back on him and you walk away from him, it's not going to be because somebody put a gun to your face and said, deny the Lord. If you walk away from the Lord, it's going to be because of your own wretched, worthless heart. Our heart is deceitful. It deceives us. And it just says, no, no, go ahead, man. You, you don't need this. You don't need to follow Jesus. You don't need that, right? But we need to be faithful unto the Lord. We need to stick with the Lord no matter what comes, no matter what happens in our lives. And Peter and them had the right idea, right? But we're going to see what Jesus is going to say about the right. They had the right idea, but they failed. And Jesus said, no, no, you're all going to fail me. What would he say to us at South City Church if Jesus stood here and said, all of you are going to fail me? What would we say? Would we be like Peter and the apostles and say, no, not me, Lord. You're going to have to kill me to deny the Lord. We haven't seen that happen in America. I don't think, I don't think. We see it in other countries, but it's coming. <laughs> it's coming to America. It's getting bad. It's getting worse. And people are really, really out to get the Christians, to get the believers, right? It's happening. The government and all these other people out. You can't do this. You can't do that. And the Christians are always mocking us, always, always putting us down. Always, and, and they're going to try to come up with laws. I know it's, it's coming to try to ban us that we can't even uh, 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 talk in public about Jesus. We can't even meet in public about Jesus. And what are we going to do? We're going to meet in public. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> South City Church, you know what? You can't speak against uh, uh, homosexuality. The Bible, wait a minute. The Bible speaks against homosexuality, but you can't do that. Okay, you know what? Guess what? Uh, they're going to say, we're going to put you in jail, Pastor Roger, if you speak. Guess what? I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about it in there, too. You know what it means? And speak against it there in there and also in jail. That's just the way it is. What is that? Turkey, right? What can a turkey teach us about faithfulness? Yeah, did you know that male turkeys, they have... Uh, 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 they're, they're often called toms or gobblers. Did you, did you know that? Toms. I'm, I'm glad my name is not Tom. Toms or gobblers, right? It's an ugly animal, <laughs> right? <laughs> did you know they have a, a, a unique ability, right? That when a tom gobbles, you know why they're doing that? You know the noise? Can somebody make it? <laughs> there you go. Oh, we got some good turkeys in here. <laughs> did you know when they do that, they're trying to call the hens, the female turkeys, right? They're calling the hens and Usually the hens within within range, right? They'll come ooh, and try to find their, it's mating time, right? So they'll come, they'll hear that, right? And usually if a tom is with a hen, they're mating, he doesn't go with another hen, right? If he, if he gobbles and other hens come around, if he's with one, he'll stick with her, usually, right? Because uh, turkeys don't mate for life. But usually when they have one that they're mating with, they'll stick with her, you know, for, for a while, right? So, to the next season, right? <laughs> it goes against his nature to go with another hen, right, while he's with one already, right? But there's exceptions, right? Turkeys don't mate for life, like I just said, right? Every now and then, there's a tom that will violate his instincts, right? And he'll leave his hen, the one that he's mating with, to go to meet another one, right? And most of the times when he leaves, that hen, 
to go with another one, you know what happens? He never comes back. You know why? Because he's usually, it's not another hen that was calling that was trying to meet with him, right? <laughs> it's usually an assassin holding a shotgun, right? With a turkey whistle in his mouth, right? <laughs> calling him to, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> the moral of this story, right, is that, hey, if a Tom would have stayed with his lady, right, he would have enjoyed, almost guaranteed to have a, live a happy life. Don't do it. Don't, don't, don't go. Don't stray away from your hand, right? <laughs> don't do it, right? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. If you walk away from the Lord, you're only going to be met with disaster, right? <laughs> and some of us know that. Some of us know that firsthand, right? <laughs> All the apostles fell away. There was brokenness and failure. They knew what they had done, right? But think about this. They were broken until the resurrection. They were broken until the Great Commission. They were broken until the apostles all heard Jesus say, I am with you always. Remember that? Remember when he said that, right? I am with you. We have to be careful about our faithfulness to the Lord, right? We got to know, we got to be aware of our own deceitful human nature. We'll deceive ourselves, right? Be aware of the danger of pride. Pride will get you. Pride will get you, right? Be aware of the danger of trusting in your own strength. Don't trust them. We're weak. I know that. I know I'm weak, right? And be aware of the necessity to be humble before the Lord. That's the way we live our lives. Always humble before an awesome, all-powerful, true and living God that we don't come up to him and say, God, you don't know what you're doing. You're wrong, God. We don't do that. We always remain humble before him, and we have to be aware of the reality of the forgiveness of the blood of Jesus. Always have that in our minds. We fail, okay, we'll have forgiveness. And remember this, the promise of true victory over all of our weaknesses one day when the Lord returns. He promises us that all this is going to be gone. And we cling to that, that. Lord, I failed you, but one day, one day when you come back, you're going to come back for me. And you're going to do away with all this, everything that I struggle with, Lord. So please, Lord, help me to remain faithful. Let's take a look at point number two. Remaining faithful to Christ requires prayer. We were talking about that in Sunday school as well, about praying, the necessity of it, right? If you want to remain faithful to Christ and you don't pray, guess what? You're going to blow it, right? We'll all fail, but it gets easier as the years go by. To remain faithful to the Lord. It gets easier. And that's where we got to get to that point. We got to build up our spiritual self. Our spiritual lives. So that we're not falling for the same old tricks. That the devil throws at us. Right? The same old stuff. And he's a liar. And, and he doesn't have new tricks. He uses the same old stuff. But guess what? He uses the same old stuff. Because it works. Because we fall for it every time. Right? Let's look at verses 36 through 46. Let's take a This is quite a bit of verses, so let's just keep an eye on this. Then Jesus went to his disciples to a place, uh, with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Here we are, the garden, right? And he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. Verse 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. Who are the two sons of Zebedee? James and John, right? He takes Peter, James, and John. This was his inner circle. These were the guys that he hung out with the most out of the, all the 12, right? He hung out with Peter, James, and John, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Uh-oh, Jesus is sorrowful and troubled. Verse 38, then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That's deep, deep sorrow right there. Stay here. And keep watch with me. Do you see that? This is, he says, man, I'm so sorrowful. I'm so grieved with this to the point of death. Have you ever been there that bad? Man, that's bad, right? When I was a teenager, me and my friends, whenever we would fight with somebody, we would fight with some other guys or whatever. And, yeah, you know, we did that all the time. That was just part of growing up uh, uh, in the South Side. And so we would always fight with some other guys, right? But whenever somebody, we, we would usually say, you know what? Go one-on-one. -on -one. Go one-on-one. -on -one and then, you know, if you need help, just say, just say slack. That was our word. 
slack. If we hear somebody say slack, they need help, then we're going to get in. And usually it was just a few of us that got in. The rest of our friends wouldn't get in, right? But that was the word. Hey, man, if you're fighting with somebody, you need help, you say slack, and we'll be there, right? And Jesus is telling his apostles, slack here. He's telling them, I need some help, man. I, I'm to the point that I'm so sorrowful to the point of death that I need slack. That's what Jesus is telling them here. I need your help, you guys. I need you to pray with me. I need you to help me. I need you to be there for me, right? Think about this. When life hits us with bad problems, right, it is good to be driven to prayer. We must be taken there, right? Jesus begins, he says, I'm sorrowful and troubled. We're sorrowful and troubled as we're going through the things that are hitting us in life, right? Can you imagine this grief, man, that, that, that was so rough, that was so distressful to this water walking, storm calming, Satan rebuking, death defying son of God that he's saying, I need help. And, and Luke tells us in Luke 22 that he was uh, sweating uh, uh, drops of blood. And he's telling the apostles, I need you to be with me. I need you to pray with me. Wait a minute, this is the son of God, but he's saying, I need you guys. I need y'all to be there for me, right? I need you to help me out. When a windstorm blows your way, and it happens all the time, right? We get hit by it all the time. When your midnight hour strikes, right? When your enemies, you can see them coming at the distance. It's, oh, man, there's trouble coming, right? It's coming, right? Before you do anything else, pray. Pray and ask the Lord to be with you, to help you, to guide you, right? And, and, and usually, think about this. When big things hit us, right, we can't help it, but we pray anyway, right? It just happens. It's just kind of natural. Say, okay, man, I, I know I'm going through this stuff. God, help me. Sometimes we just yell it out, right? We don't have to worry about anything, but we got to pray for rescue. We got to ask God to help us. We got to pray for courage. We got to uh, pray for strength. God, help me to get through this. I, I need to not fail you, Lord. The, the battle is here, and, and I'm weak. But I need your help, Lord. We see the weakness that the apostles were going through, right? They're going through this weakness. They're going through this, right? And every time, every time I hear this story, and I can picture the apostles falling asleep, right? In my mind, I think, of, I, I think two things. When I hear this story, I always say to myself, how could they do that to Jesus, right? How could they do that? But then the second thing that comes to my mind is, I would have slept too. I would have slept too. But we we're just like them, right? Think about that. The apostles had made it clear that, you know, we're not going to fail. We're not going to do it, man. But we're just like they are, right? They had not thought about the weakness of their flesh, right? And, and, and it's the weakness of our flesh that brings even the best intentioned believers to failure. Think about that. Uh, have you ever have you ever done this? Uh, am I the only one, right? You have a family picnic. Everybody gets together, and the, the teenagers are playing football, and you're like, ah, come on. <laughs> I'll play with y'all, right? <laughs> and you get out there, and they start throwing the ball around. You start running, and you're, you're tackling people, and it, it's touch football, but you're tackling the little kids. Boom, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And you think, oh, man, I got, I got the skills, man. I used to do this when I was in, in, in junior high, man. I can do that, right? Woo! You think, it's like riding a bike. I, you don't forget this kind of thing, right? But think about this. The first time you start running, you run 10 yards, and then you're like, <gasps> you can't breathe. Right? <laughs> and your muscles are aching and say, wait, wait, go back and sit out, right? Think about that. We deceive ourselves. We think, I can do this. I can go out and play football with the young kids, right, with the teenagers. Our human nature lets us down. It betrays us, right? And our spiritual Nature does the same thing, right? We think, I'm spiritual, like Peter. No, 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 I can handle this. Any problem that the Lord throws at me, right? Any 26-year-old any, any with a miniskirt comes my way, I can handle it. <laughs> Whew, think about that, though. We are traitors, just like the apostles. The temptations come our way, and we surrender to them all. But wait a minute, you just said, no, I know, I know, man, everybody from South City Church, we never fail the Lord. We fail the Lord, right? <laughs> but think about that. It's those temptations, those traitors within our hearts that we must flush out with prayer. We must pray. Look at verses 39 through 46. Going a little further. 
Jesus fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. <laughs> and look at what Jesus said. Couldn't you, man, keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, uh, 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Get a load of this. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's how we are, right? 42. Jesus went away a second time and he prayed, my father. I like the way he prays, my father. If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Verse 44. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, right? Saying the same thing. Man, these guys are they're, they're dropping the ball. That's what he's saying, right? Verse 45. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping? Are you still resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. He saw the enemy coming. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. These are tough words here, these last ones here. Jesus is still telling them, you're still with me. I still need you. Get up with me. Slack. Let us go together. The enemy is coming. I need you all to be with me. Here at this point, Jesus teaches us how to pray when we come to our own Gethsemane, right? Look at what he teaches us. Jesus teaches us how to pray, right? When we go through difficult circumstances. Jesus says, first, plead for God's deliverance. When you're going through an illness, a sickness, the doctor says, mm, I think it might be cancer. Lord, take it away. Take it away, right? Take it away. Take it away, right? So will the Lord do it? Yes. He will, right? Sometimes the Lord will help us when our time of need. And look at what, what, what Jesus said. If it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Sometimes the Lord says yes. Sometimes the Lord says no, right? It is up to him, right? And it's natural for us when we're facing our own Gethsemane, right? When we're facing this bitter cup that sometimes gets thrown into our lives, right? That we ask the Lord, take it away. It's the first thing we pray. Somebody tells you, or you got a bad illness, a sickness, Lord, take it away, take it away. What about the second thing that we're supposed to do is surrender to God's will? This is hard. This is hard to do, right? Look at what Jesus said. Yet not as I will, but as you will. That's hard because God, they told me I might have cancer. Take it away. But can you say that part? <laughs> but as you will. That's tough. That's hard. There's a lot of death in the Christian life. Death of dreams. I wanted to be a lawyer. God said, nope. <laughs> Death of plans. I wanted to be in a rock band. God said, nope. <laughs> Death of pride. Right? <laughs> God will tell you, no, no, your dreams are gone. Your plans are gone. No more pride for you. It has to die. I have something else for you. I have something else for you. Sometimes God, when bad things come our way, sometimes God kills it immediately. Right? But sometimes God says, hold on. I want you to deal with this. I want you to look at this issue in your life, and I want you to let it go. It could be a person. It could be somebody that you're hanging out with that you shouldn't be hanging with. God says, let it go. Send it away. Turn your back on that thing and walk away and walk towards me. What is it that's holding you back from following Jesus wholeheartedly? What is it? And it's God telling you to get away from it. What is he telling you? The most important thing of our story of the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is there getting ready to get arrested, right? And he's praying and the apostles fail, right? The most important thing here is not the failure of the disciples, but the most important thing is the victory of Jesus when he surrendered to the Father's will. And he said, okay. This is the only way, this is the only way that I can save Sandra Sines, that I can save Johnny Reyna, is for me to die on the cross, then I'll do it. When you are faced with these dark nights, right, 
Think about this. The apostles didn't pray with Jesus, but when you're going through a tough time, you can rest assured that Jesus will pray with you. He will be there, and he will be praying and telling his father, Father, help them out. They're going through a tough time, and they're praying, and they're crying out, will you help them out, Father? Will you be with them, right? In our dark times, when we're wrestling with the will of God, right, we need to remember that we are facing our own sinfulness, our own resistance to do God's will, and our own distrust of God's ways. Because God says, you know, know what? I'm going to help you, but I want you to go about it this way. No, no God, but I want to, no, no. And God said, no, no, come this way. You, it's not the way you think, but I'm going to help you, but you got to go around this way. And a lot of times we know, God, you got it wrong, and we fall flat on our faces, right? In conclusion here, Jesus wanted his disciples to stay awake and pray with him, right? Because this struggle seemed even too big for the Son of God, right? And when they failed him, right, Luke 22 says that an angel sent from heaven appeared and strengthened Jesus. Jesus is there, drops of blood coming from his sweat, right? And said, man, my, my, my friends, my apostles, they left me. They abandoned me. God says, oh, I'm still here. Sends an angel to give him strength. But when we struggle, right, we can remember that Jesus himself will come to us. Jesus himself will help us, and he will strengthen us. You can rest assured on that. You can take that to the bank, and nobody can rob that, right? <laughs> nobody can rob that, right? When, remember when Jesus told Simon Peter, hey, hey, Peter, Satan has asked for you. He wants to just mess you up, right? He wants to sift you like wheat. But Jesus said, but I prayed for you, Simon. I prayed for you. For you and he said that your faith will not fail how many of us need jesus to pray for us that our faith will not fail that we will stand strong to the test when some friends come up to you and say hey you want to go smoke some weed <laughs> what are you gonna say well if it was sunday i would say no you know <laughs> no you don't do that right you, you don't do that mm -hmm.